Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. In recognition of women's history, we've tried to bring out the wonderful stories of the heroines that are known as our women. Sometimes the stories are just amazingly inspiring, and sometimes they have sort of a rough edge but become more inspiring as you realize what a person has gone through. Speaking more personally, to seeing their shadow and having the courage to be able to grow and to become who they truly are, to be in touch with that self rather than hide from it. On the program today, we'll be talking about a book simply titled The Source of All Things. And our guest joining us on the program today is an award-winning journalist and contributing editor at Backpack Backpacker Magazine. Her work has been published in the United States and in countries around the world as well. She has also won the National Magazine Award in 2009 and was selected to, for Best American Sports Writing and Best American Magazine Writing. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today our guest, Ms. Tracy Ross. Tracy, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Now, you take a look at the cover of your book, The Source of All Things. There's a girl on a boulder in a stream, and the first thing a person would take a look at is, this is a wonderful nature book that would inspire us to kind of get out of the bustle of the city and reconnect with nature. But the truth is, there's a lot more to it than that. In fact, it kind of eluded me a little bit. Why did you title the book The Source of All Things? Well, the story um, surrounds this very magical and special place in Idaho in the Sockeys Mountains, which is this rugged mountain range um, near Twin Falls in, in, in the south. And for me, this place, Redfish Lake, at the base of the Sockeys, was the source of all the most beautiful things and all the most horrific things in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, the story is about sexual abuse, and that's where the abuse first began on a camping trip with my family in 1979. And it's also the place that I returned to um, as a 36-year-old to take my stepfather back there and confront him about the abuse. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely the source of so much in my life. And it also has um, a, an added layer of meaning in that Redfish Lake is a place where sockeye salmon migrate 900 miles from the Pacific Ocean to spawn and lay their eggs and die. And so mm -hmm. for them, too, it's the source of birth and death. I see. Now, this was a point in your life that you were eight years old. Now, to track back, uh, your father had died, your biological father, by the time you were four years old. And, and so Donnie comes into your life as your mom was feeling at her low point and just seemed to be everything I guess a child would want. And I, and I really uh, thought it was cute that you said, we decided to tie the knot. It was you, your brother Chris, and your mother to this guy Donnie. He seemed like everything, and in a world today where step-parenting doesn't have a lot of times such a, I guess, a good image, this almost seemed like a dream come true, it seems. Oh, it was for my family, and especially for my brother, and especially for me, mm -hmm. because I was a very high-energy kid, and I've always had a really strong connection to the outdoors. My grandparents owned their own planes, and they flew all over the place, pheasant hunting and fishing and so my brother and I were introduced to the outdoors at a very, very young age. And then when we lived in Idaho, even though my p grandparents gave us that, it wasn't until this kind of swashbuckling John Denver figure arrived in our lives, and he had a Jeep and this cool black lab dog that I loved. And he taught me to ski. He taught me to hunt. He taught me everything I knew about the outdoors. And... So he really was kind of this knight, as I call him, a knight in shining bell bottoms. <laughs> who came in and brought so much joy to our family. Mm -hmm. So it must have been really confusing when the night that you were out camping at uh, Lake Redfish that the horror began, and you didn't really seem to understand what you were supposed to do or what was really going on. Tell us about that. Oh, I had no idea. I mean, I was eight years old. Up until that moment, I had lived a very, you know, pristine life, a very happy, sheltered life. And on that night in 1979, as my stepdad tells it, he had been drinking. We were in our trailer, a roadrunner camper, which is a very small space. And my mom was spread out on the, the bunk bed below mine. I was in a little bunk at the top of the trailer, and my uh, stepfather said he stood up, stumbled forward, and his hands 
stretched out and touched me at a place that surprised him. Mm -hmm. And instead of moving his hands, he just kept them there Mm -hmm. and did, you know, whatever he did. And I, I was sleeping. And so it was, it was as if I was suddenly in a nightmare and I felt these hands and I smelled this breath and I recognized it and didn't recognize it. And then the next morning I got up and waited until I heard my stepdad go outside and crawled into a sleeping bag with my mom and told her, and she and my stepfather both denied that anything had happened. He told her nothing had happened and she believed him. And so they proceeded to convince me that something I had seen, heard, smelled, and and felt actually was just a scary nightmare. Now, Tracy, this did continue from my understanding. He, and by the end of the story, he recollects that it might have been anywhere between 25 and 50 times. What I found, uh, I guess, astonishing is as I was reading about the first encounter in your book, The Source of All Things, and as it continued, that you seem to be slumbering in between worlds of the dream world and is this reality. And I started thinking, there seems to be an extra manipulation going on here that you don't commonly hear about. And you share what that actually was by the end of the book when your father confesses what he had actually done. But what were dreams for you like and reality? I mean, you could see it was beginning to really tear you apart. Describe what was going on for you on the inside, if you could. Oh, my God, that's such a good question and and rather difficult to articulate. But, um, you know, I knew that bad things were happening to me because in this kind of half-awake state is when my stepdad would most often come into my room. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he would say things like, oh, you called out for me. I'm here to help you. And then he would start to molest me and abuse me and I would be awake, um, but because it was it was just this state of, I, I don't know if I, part of my coping with it was kind of just to block it out as it was happening, um, but I definitely, I was terrified. There was no way, you know, I tried many times to say stop and, you know, to kind of shake around and act like a wolverine, as I say, but I, you know, there came, it quickly became clear to me that, he was going to do what he wanted to do no matter what I said. And whenever I tried to tell my mom or my grandmother or my brother or various people, no one believed me. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, it was something that I had to endure. And I remember almost every night going to bed with a terrified feeling and waking up feeling really groggy and unsure of what had happened. I just couldn't trust my perception at all anymore. Mm-hmm kind of on the border of being mad at such a young age. <laughs> oh, yeah, seems. definitely. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I ask that as a person, uh, you know, when it comes to dreams, dreams are also a perception of reality all at the same time. And so it became, for me, a curiosity what that was like for you. That must have just kind of almost split your personality into a million pieces, it would seem like. I, you know, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it definitely has stuck with me and been a problem my entire mm-hmm. life, mm-hmm. where I, especially in social situations, I had a very and have a very hard time trusting my perception of what is happening. And, you know, if, I'm in, if I have an encounter that isn't, you know, the best one, or I get in an argument or with someone or over something at work or something, I... I will always turn it on myself and I will always question over question my reaction to whatever happened because I'll think that I'm overreacting or, you know, I'm making things up in my own mind and I am convinced, I'm absolutely positive that that's a direct um, effect of the abuse because, you know, there have even been studies done that when a child suffers abuse, abuse, something in their brain actually becomes rewired or unwired and there is neurological damage that that makes it very difficult just on an emotional and spiritual level to see the world clearly mm-hmm. there's no doubt about that tracy uh what i found astonishing and i'm using that word again because it is is even though this was happening from the time that you were eight 
through your early teens, you finally decided to burst out the door and you'd had enough, and actually your intention wasn't a good one, but for a lot of people, I'm sure, who have been in a situation like this, they think it's the only way out, and that was to basically commit suicide, just to leave. It seemed the easy way out. But what I also began noticing, too, is somewhere deep inside of you, it's like a lotus flower was beginning to grow in courage, that you were going to fight this regardless of the fact that you really love this man, and, and, and as I understand to this day, you still do that it had to change, but you also knew that taking this step would be one that might just tear the family apart and you would be the one to blame. That's not an easy place for a person to be, especially as a young girl. Oh, no. As a 14-year-old, it's the absolute worst place, I think, to be because I, I had no support system whatsoever. I knew that I had to save my life. I knew that if I didn't take action and get out of that situation, that my dad was going to take the abuse to a place that that I, that I would have killed me. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I really, I was out of options. And I ran, as you say, I, I ran two miles to the Perrine Bridge, which is um, 500 feet above the Snake River, and stood there and really thought, this is all I can do. I, I can only die because there's no other place for me. And then I think the image of the lotus flower is so beautiful. For me, I've always thought of it as like this sort of golden orb of energy that is sort of in my solar plexus, and I've always felt it really strongly. And I do think that that was that sort of surge of power, surge of energy, or surge of God, or whatever it was, on that bridge is what convinced me to turn around and start walking back in the direction of my perpetrator and then continue walking and go and tell a friend's mom. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the point then the police became involved and the confrontations began. And uh, This is a direction that can be salvation, it can help save, but in a lot of cases, as I understand, when it comes to getting involved or getting the system involved, that could become dangerous, and it sounded to me like it kind of went that direction for you as well. A system that should be protecting children from situations like this can actually become more harmful in ways. Could you describe that? Oh, definitely. I I think it's gotten a lot better. Um, I've been working with the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children and talking a lot with Mary Polito, the executive director, and from what she tells me, it's, you know, the system has really improved. But in 1985, in Twin Falls, Idaho, which is a very small town in a very, you know, obscure state, um, the, the welfare system was just beginning to grapple with childhood sexual abuse as a social issue. And so they, I think, didn't even really know the clear path to take. Mm-hmm. And so I was just one of, I'm sure, thousands of kids who slipped through the cracks My dad was never prosecuted. Um, They felt that reuniting the family was the best option. For me, it was not the best option because I was sent away while my stepdad moved in with my mom. And then after a year of abstinence, and I say that in quotes, from me, my stepdad and mom were able to come and pick me up from a town in Oregon where I was living and bring me home. And it, it was one of the most, unsettling and confusing and difficult times of my life because even though we were healed and we'd gotten over it, I felt so vulnerable and so angry and had all these emotions that I didn't know how to deal with and, you know, really lashed out and became a pretty rebellious kid until I sent myself to boarding school. Ah, now that's what I also noticed too that I I find incredible about your resolve in something like this. This can be something that can break and literally amputate a person's spirit to where they not only can't function to be sustaining but thrive. You found some resolve within yourself, as you described earlier, a golden orb, where you were very successful at things, but then you would fall into a self-destructive pattern as almost if, I don't really deserve this. Yes. That's so perceptive. I mean, that's exactly it. And, you know, some readers have really, uh, and some of my early readers when I was still in the drafting process of the book had had trouble with that. 
you know, they wanted a clear upward trajectory. <laughs> Don't we all you know? see that too often in the movies? Exactly. <laughs> Here's the tragedy. But, hey, you know, as long as we move this direction in the next hour and ten minutes and, and then show, <laughs> you know, and, and it get borders on ridiculous at times to me. And I sometimes wish they wouldn't play those out. But, anyway, go ahead. Oh, well, it definitely <laughs> creates a false, you know, reality. But, you know, for, for me it was, to, you know, one step forward, ten steps back. But I did. I I had this feeling and I had this belief in the good moments that I was going to become something, that I was going to transcend my past. I would never have put it in those words at that time. But I just, I've always been an ambitious person and I've always thrived. Um, I'm a Scorpio and, you know, I've always thrived under sort of dire circumstances and and it, it it propelled me forward, and especially when I got to a place like Interlock and Arts Academy where I went to high school for a year, I I was suddenly surrounded by 400 kids who were all wildly talented, who were all not normal, you know, like not normal in the sense that kids from Twin Falls High School were, who were just uh, so driven and so creative, and I felt right at home with them. And it was very healing for me to be there and to be able to immerse myself in theater and the arts. And it was also Interlochen um, is across the street from a state park in northern Michigan. And so it was the first place since my very young childhood and since the abuse began that I, um, that I reunited with wilderness and nature and, and had the realization that that's what I needed mm-hmm. to keep healing. I think it's important for a lot of us to, I, you know, being uh, of Native American blood myself, I remember a saying that simply says, when you have a problem or a challenge, go to the woods and sit silently and you'll be given an answer. And you certainly had a friend by the name of Mays who sort of was imparting that kind of wisdom on to you, but in her own way. Yes, exactly. Um, Mays w- was and still is a very strong spiritual force in my family. And um, one thing that I don't think comes across in the book so much is she and her family were all incredible outdoors people. And, you know, all of her kids grew up rafting and raft guiding. And they were a family that I emulated and that I um, really wanted. I've kind of modeled my mothering and my family after their family in a sense. But, yeah, Mays. Um, was one of the first people who took me in um, kind of spiritually and offered me shelter from what was going on. And that that was actually before I left for Interlochen. But she has remained an incredibly strong guiding light in my life. Um, And I'm not necessarily a religious person. She's a pretty strong Catholic. But she has constantly um, continued to counsel me in terms of, you know, redemption and self-forgiveness and stuff like that. So she's been a huge piece of this, too. Mm -hmm. Now, what I love about the source of all things, even though it has the dark story, the shadow, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, what you also have in here is some incredible adventure and wonderful writing. And it was certainly a talent that as a young girl, as a teen, you began to realize, geez, I'm coming into my own. This is coming very easily for me. Would you say that you were beginning to discover a gift that would actually cause enough buoyancy for you to keep taking those steps forward to realize, okay, I was going to off myself because I thought that was the only choice I had. Somehow something prevented me from doing that. I'm now recognizing a talent, and I'm just going to go with it and not look back. And when you take a look at the adventures you have in here, you'd have to almost be a maniac to do some of them, like the idiot trot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Iditarod, yeah. Um, um, in terms of writing, that was the first part of your question, right? Right. In terms of writing, uh, I think I always knew, like when I could settle down enough to do it, to write the poems and to write you know, basically anything about my life and anything that wasn't structured sort of academic writing, I could get to a place and it would start to flow and I would think, okay, other people don't say things this way. Other people don't think things this way. This is a gift. 
but it took me a very long time. It took me until I was living in Alaska, essentially, to put put it out into the world and, you know, to make that leap from, I'm not writing for myself anymore. I have all these amazing adventures. Now I'm going to put it out there and see what the reaction is. And it was kind of at that point that I realized this is something that could that could be deep and meaningful for me and other people. And it really started to buoy me then. Um, but there were many, many years of just kind of flailing about and wandering and trying different things. And I know that I was writing all that time, but I wasn't taking it very seriously mm-hmm. while I was doing all these crazy adventures, as you say. Yeah. Well, I didn't say it. You said them in your book. <laughs> oh, right. right. <laughs> Especially the one adventure where she decides to almost confound a grizzly bear that says, no, this ain't going to happen. I'm about to eat you. And you curled up into a little ball and... Chris just said, yeah. I've got other things to go do. <laughs> yeah, I started singing Yellow Submarine. Really hope One of my favorite cartoons of all time, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, cool. <laughs> now, in your relationships with men, that couldn't have been easy for you. No. No, and it was pretty disastrous most of the time. And um, I, I, I've, I've always had... Um, you know, difficulties with intimacy and stuff like that. But I also think that I definitely lurched around between relationships because I didn't have any self. Um, I didn't care that much about myself. Mm -hmm. And so I would sort of dive into these relationships that were never really that healthy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously a prime example of that is my first husband, uh, Colin, and that was an abusive relationship. And part of the reason, I think, that that became so abusive and so ugly is because I was so isolated living in Alaska and really had no one to turn to, even though I, I had isolated myself there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I had, a really, I had a really hard time. That's been one of the major struggles of my life until I met my, my current husband, Sean. And he, you know, it's just the perfect alchemy. It's the perfect mix and to help me both work through my demons and to understand what love is. Now, that's also was a big challenge for you in having children, uh, both of your sons, and uh, that was could you trust your dad and your mother to watch them while you were gone? And you were on a trip to uh, Sun River for a little shopping with your mom when you decided, nope, I'm turning around, I don't trust this situation. But I thought that your instinct served you well. You know, how do you submit that sort of trust when the innocence and trust at a particular age being eight that you had could be just handed over to somebody who didn't feel or really didn't earn it, so to speak? Right. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and I mean, that, that is, some, again, something that I grappled with really, really uh, seriously and I think, I think painfully you know, once I had kids, once I had my first son, Scout, and then 17 months later, the second, my stepdad, who's been in my life this whole time because my mom didn't divorce him, and I've always been a person who needed a family. I needed parents, and part, partly because my biological dad died, I think, and, you know, I, I think we need our parents, mostly um, everyone, and um, no matter what they do to us. And um, I, and also, you know, I, I couldn't not be in my dad's life and be in my mom's life because they were together. Mm-hmm. And so when I had my kids, I could see how much joy they brought to both of my parents and especially my stepdad. And this was agonizing for me because I wanted to be the good daughter. I wanted everything to be okay. And it was kind of my role in my family to be the one who brought the light. And I could see these babies and, you know, and also having kids that are 17 months apart, it's it's pretty difficult. So I would take the help when I could get it and, you know, from both of my parents. And eventually I really came to understand that by letting them, my kids, stay with my parents, I was doing the same thing that my mom had done to me potentially, mm-hmm. just handing them over because I knew the dangers. Mm-hmm. And that's that's really a huge part of what led to the big breakdown that I had that eventually 
made me confront my stepdad. I just knew I couldn't go on. I couldn't go on living a lie. And I couldn't keep putting my kids in harm's way. So, they, I mean, they were the ma- one of the major impetus um, for me going back into the statues with my stepdad. Now, you also see in this book where you're emerging as your own personal hero. And heroes, most people think of Superman or Spider-Man, and they're out saving the world against crime. I've always found the true heroes are those that see their shadow. They love that shadow because it's a source of who they are. And one of the opportunities that you talk about in your book is that you were part of a challenger program. I've always had mixed emotions about programs where somebody comes in the middle of the night, snatches a kid out of bed blindfolded, runs them to the middle of the desert for the next nine weeks, you know, and that that's supposed to reshape who they are. But uh-huh. in some cases, people think this is effective for very troubled kids. Mm-hmm. Tell us about your experience with that program. Well, one of the reasons that I put that mm. that experience in the book is because, um, I don't know if you ever read, John Krakauer wrote a story for Outside Magazine in the early 90s, I think, about... Um, Wall Walker and Horsehair, the two guys who ran this operation. And I don't think they were with Challenger at the time. They might have been with another organization. Mm -hmm. But they essentially, under their watch, um, one of the kids who was in the program died. And there are allegations of abuse. And it was a, a pretty abusive program, you know, where if a kid cussed, she would have to carry an eight pound rock. And we're talking. You know, it could be 110. In the middle of the desert, we had these crazy rations where we would eat a quarter cup of oats in the morning, and then we'd get like a package of ramen noodles for lunch. We could either eat it cold like a potato chip or with cold water, dry like a potato chip or with cold water. And I just, in retrospect, thought it was so interesting that that is what I would choose of all places to go and work you know, right out of high school, Mm -hmm. the adventure obviously would appeal to me to go and be in the woods for, you know, in the desert for three weeks at a time walking. But, you know, the fact that I would put myself in this situation that ended up being really kind of abusive to kids, I just, there were some other powers at work there. Um, But, you know, overall, I'm with you. I didn't think that it, I I saw mostly bad results. Mm. I saw mostly kids suffering and coming out of that experience, looking at their parents like they had betrayed them in a way that you can't imagine. And a lot of things that I heard from the kids were stories of how their parents fought all the time or they were alcoholics or, you know, clearly some sketchy parenting, you know, leading to these kids acting out. And it was so mirrored my own situation. Mm Mm-hmm that I, it it was just, it was so strange for me, but I also felt that I was put there for a reason, and that was because I could be relatable to these kids. Mm -hmm. And I could say, you know, I've been where you are. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, there was one uh, particular moment where you were sitting on the edge of a cliff, I believe it was, with a girl who had something she wanted to talk with you about, but then you had to restrain yourself from sharing a truth of your own because that was just part of the rules. And I thought, wait a minute. You know, if the kids see, here's someone like you who seems to have it together. You know, you're strong. You're moving each day one step at a time. You seem happy about your life. But really, if you knew this is really what has been going on in my life, and if I could do it, you've got a shot, that probably would have been more effective than staying quiet. Oh, definitely. And looking back, you know, at this point I would – share anything. I mean, that's part of the reason I've shared this story, knowing that I'm laying my whole life's most intimate moments out for everyone to judge and react to and read and know. You know, I've, my philosophy is I did make it to the other side. I am that abuse victim who managed to work through it to a point of happiness and acceptance. And, you know, I definitely don't think forgiveness is for everyone. And I have my own sort of definition of forgiveness with my stepfather, but I believe that the way that we teach and the way that we help other people is through our story. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if I had been not 20 at the time and 
or 19 and, you know, had had a little more maturity and life experience and insight, so, yeah, that would have been the most valuable thing Mm -hmm. to share the truth. I might ask you then, I know you've been asked this question, but the, that, the question I want to ask you then, how have you come to define what forgiveness is for yourself? Uh, you ask a really good question. <laughs> um, I, I used to think, like I think the majority of Judeo-Christian people, that forgiveness is this state, this like static state, and we forgive, and then we move on. And um, in the process of writing this book, I've discovered that, that like, the, knowing the truth and forgiveness are really intertwined for me. So I thought that I would go on this hike with my stepdad. I had these four questions. I would find out the answers. They wouldn't be that bad. And I would say, okay, the work is done. I forgive you. Let's move on. And what I found was, the answers were so much worse than I had told myself. It was The abuse was so much worse than I had let myself remember and believe. And when we walked out of the sawtooth together, I remember wanting to just tear my dad's head off. Mm-hmm. And it part of my forgiveness has come with actually his, ability to stay in this with me to the very end of this book process and continue to be as honest and open and committed to it as he can. And so every time I see that happen and watch him, you know, suffering, but but staying in it, it opens my heart more. Mm -hmm. And in that opening, I find forgiveness. And I've also said that I now have forgiveness with with new rules and boundaries. And by that I mean that I, in writing the book, I've taken so much back to myself. I've become a better mother, a better wife, I've become a better friend, and I've learned to put boundaries around that which is most valuable to me, which is my family. And so my dad doesn't have access to my kids like he once did. And that feels harsh for him, but to me, it's just setting these really healthy boundaries that allows me that allow me to grow in forgiveness of him. Mm-hmm. Now, people would look at that, and I'm sure you may have heard this from certain people, Tracy. Don't you think your dad has suffered enough? Don't you <laughs> think he's been forgiven? But I'm hearing you clearly. You know, this is sometimes the decisions heroes have to make. And those are the hard ones, but yeah. they're usually the right ones. <laughs> right, exactly. And like I've always said, and through writing the magazine article that led to this book and did this book, it's I refuse to. I mean, it's I don't even refuse to. It's just impossible for me to tie this whole thing up with a pretty bow. No. You know, it's an ongoing process, and <clears throat> I believe that. We will get to the other side. I believe that my whole family will be stronger for it, including my brother and my mom. And I believe that this is our reckoning. Mm -hmm. And we're going through the really difficult part now. The writing of the book, contrary to what a lot of people think, was not nearly as hard as what the aftermath has been. I can imagine. (laughs) It's been because you also say... Uh, one of the things that really just chomped you with the bit was how your mother and your own brother, Chris, never even approached you to yeah. ask, what was this like? And I remember you used an interesting analogy uh, from a friend of yours earlier in the, in, in the book, is that, you know, it's interesting when you walk across the crosswalk and you get hit by a truck, everybody's sending you balloons and flowers and visiting you at the hospital. But when you cross that same crosswalk and you're hit by life with sexual abuse, People just don't want to really talk about it too much, and you become isolated and alone. Exactly. And as a kid, that is the absolute worst thing that can happen. And, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to really be an advocate for kids in this process, too, because yeah, I believe that kids should be seen, heard, seen, um, heard and believed when they tell us things have happened to them until proven otherwise. Mm-hmm. 
you know, because it's just so devastating to be an innocent child and be di- disenfranchised, disbelieved, written off. I feel like that's the worst crime. Mm-hmm. The book is the source of all things. Our guest today, Ms. Tracy Ross. Now, one of the things I... And I enjoyed many things. One of the first things I want to talk about, <clears throat> I found it interesting that you had great detail and memory when it came to things like uh, Izod shirts, Donnie and Marie. I mean, you had these details. You didn't just say these were blue jeans, but these were, you know, shrunk to fit Levi blue jeans. <laughs> what was the necessity of sharing such tremendous details? It's almost like you're giving free advertising to people. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yeah, well, I, mean, I just found that glory. I said, you know, of all the books, and I've read lots of them, believe me, over the years and, and interviewed countless others, but I can't remember a time that I've seen so much detail given to a pair of pants, socks, underwear, shirts, backpacks. <laughs> you know, I could see the shows. You know, I was watching Donnie and Marie or Sonny and Sherry. You know, that kind of gives you a nice timeline. But the actual detail you gave to the clothes or what you were eating, to me, I just found that very funny. <laughs> that's funny. I don't know. I mean, I felt... <laughs> Partly, it was probably a technique that I thought, you know, added more life to a scene. And partly, you know, I remember, like, Levi's shrink tickets defined our lives in a right. way in the 80s. Like and San Francisco jeans, for instance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's what everyone was wearing. And that's right. what my brother wore. And we were a Russell family. You know what I mean? Right, right. Whatever that says about us socioeconomically, it says something. Mm-hmm. We've been brainwashed into buying those things. That's what it is. <laughs> right. Yeah. While going on our own adventures just to see if they hold up as well as the commercial says. Yeah. <laughs> now, the other thing, too, is your sons. Um, uh, the idea that they came to you, they choose their parents, and many times throughout our program, uh, we've had people that have said the very same thing, that we pretty much choose our parents and the life that we want to come into. There are lessons that we're here to learn, but the way I like the way it's described in your book, uh, The Source of All Things, is you talk about them being stars coming into, and why that grabbed me is there was a time I was at my a uh, friend of my wife's house, and there was this painting that her husband, as a hobby, does, and I was like, I want to buy that, and what it was is you see a window seal, and it's obviously at night, you have two glasses, and a bottle with about a third of a bottle of wine left. You can tell it's two people that have been enjoying wine on an evening. But there's a glaring star right there in the window seal, and then a couple of other little ones behind it. And I thought, you know, at that moment as I'm watching this, this star is coming in to be born into this human form. Yeah. Think about that. And when you write what you wrote in your book about your sons and the way they were reflecting that same thing, I thought, this is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, that you'd seen that before and that, yeah, I mean, part of that is Scout and Hatcher, you know, part of it is the story that we've told them and part of it is them believing that that that's how babies, you know, when they were younger, now they're figuring it out, obviously, but, you know, believing that that's how babies are born. Mm-hmm. And and I actually do believe that, I've had a couple experiences um, where, and this might be getting way too far out there, but um, right after Scout was born, I had a couple of these really weird experiences where I would be nursing him in the middle of the night. It would be 3 in the morning or 2 in the morning. It was right after 9-11. He was born um, in May of, of 2000, or, uh, May of 2001. And so right after 9-11, I had these two experiences. One was I, I was nursing him and I could sense this presence in the room. And I, I'm not, you know, really that, you know, I felt my, my real father before and kind of known he's around, but this isn't something that happens to me very often. And, and I, I, it kept coming back. It wasn't just that one night. And I soon came to realize that there was this little girl who had passed away or who was waiting to come into a life, and she just wanted to be close to the intimacy of a mother nursing this new baby. Mm-hmm. And this new baby had this connection to the other world. And um, that was so that was one. And then another time when I was nursing him, I had this total out-of-body experience where I was falling with one of the people who jumped out of one of the trade, World Trade Towers. Mm-hmm. And it, it just really struck me as, 
you know, these babies are conduits to the, the ethereal world, to the other world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know where that whole idea began, but Scout and Catcher had it as their own idea, too. It was just so wonderful and interesting for me that I had to include that. Do you know what I mean? Well, I do, because it shows that there are things beyond us that should encourage us, just like you, to take the hero's journey of courage, to realize this is a part of my life, and as bad and as dark things can get, if I could just take one more step, if I could just take one more breath, and I'm sure you encountered those uh, moments on backcap backpacking trips as well. You know, people yeah. who have done Everest, they say the say, if I could just put one more step, and then pretty soon you're at the summit. That if you could just do that, that the miracle really begins to unfold itself as to what maybe you're here to learn. Is that a way of looking at it, do you think, Tracy? Absolutely. I think that is the way. It's staying on the path. It's not running. In my case, it's not cutting my family off. It's staying the path. And in my, you know, in my story, it's finding the truth. It's searching for the truth. Mm-hmm. Because that's really all we have. And I, I still and do feel that as an individual, I couldn't even know my past until I knew my past. Mm-hmm. And now I have a much clearer sense of what I'm supposed to do and who I am. And that is just taking that one step in front of the other. And, and the weight of the stress is better just by knowing who, who I am, where I came from. Now, Tracy, this may seem like a pretty difficult question, but have you been able to go back to that eight-year-old girl and tell her you're just fine the way you are? Um, No. Not so much. Fair enough. Because sometimes when an abuse happens, as I understand it, is that's when, I guess, aging or growing kind of stop. They stand oh, still yeah. in time. And you can see that you're fighting with that throughout your life. But do you feel like you've kind of merged at least enough to feel sort of whole? Oh, definitely. Good. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And I definitely feel like I have grown and have become an adult through this process. You know, at the ripe old age of now 40. Hooray! But you're not beyond <laughs> 50 yet, but you're on your way. See? <laughs> right, exactly. I know one of the most uh, interesting things I had heard from an author or read about uh, something an author had wrote, they said that finding out uh, a general consensus what a person's favorite age was Consistently, they said the 60s were the most enjoyable ages to be, and it sounds wow. like you're on your way. Yeah. Oh, let it <laughs> keep getting better. I'm all for it. Now, um, since the book has been out, what kind of reception have you had from people who have read? You know, overwhelmingly, people have just been thrilled with it. And, you know, that is, um, you know, that's readers, that's reader feedback, that's feedback that I've gotten on Facebook, that's feedback from doing readings. I did a Skype book club in Boston yesterday, and, um, you know, people who read the book and get a chance to talk to me about it, they just, they they read it fast. They say that it really, you know, hurdles forward, and they feel that as I have tried to convey and it's not so much a story about sexual abuse. It's a story about all these other things. It's a story about the healing power of wilderness. It's a story about forgiveness. It's a family story. A friend just uh, Facebooked me today and said, one thing that I loved about this book is the abuse was just a character. Mm-hmm. I thought that was such a great way to say it. But actually, I would agree with that. I love that. Because you find maybe too often, and I can't, you know, pinpoint any fingers, but that when a book such as something like this comes out about an abuse, is that that's the whole thing. And it's like, okay, but what about in between? You know, what is the person really thinking? What are they really feeling? How do they carry on about their lives? That's the hero's journey that I think people should hear more about, that yes, this did happen, but how they carry on. I hope that that is coming across because I have to say I've been a little bit dismayed um, with uh, media because 
I feel in some sense that that there's a feeling out there that it doesn't focus enough on the abuse. And that was never my intent. My intent all along has been, obviously, to just write the truth. But, but I've always felt that my story is special because of where I've ended up. Mm-hmm. You know, that the abuse really is just one part of it. It's an instigator. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not the whole bulk of my life. And I, I really want to get that message out because I think a lot more people will come to the book. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, not be afraid that it's, that it's about abuse or that it starts with abuse, that it's actually a story about hope and healing. Mm-hmm. Wonderfully written. Again, the book is The Source of All Things. Our guest today, Tracy Ross. Were you able to ever re-encounter that female apparition that you uh, had experienced in New Mexico? La Llorona? Yes. Um, no, nope. I think it's because she lives in New Mexico. <laughs> so there's no thin veils where you live in Colorado where she can kind of peep through just to see how you're doing? Well, she hasn't peeped through, but I definitely think there are thin veils. I mean, my real dad peeped through one time when I was running in Alaska. When I worked in Denali National Park, I was running along a trail, and he was just there. Um, and... You know, he's peeped through a couple of other times, but out always in nature. Um, but, yeah, La Llorona, I, I, I don't even think I was supposed to have seen her. You know what I, I like? <laughs> that was a total accident, and and but it was verified. That was the weird thing, mm-hmm. is that I just started explaining it to a completely unrelated person, and he said, oh, that was La Llorona. Of course. You saw this ghost. <laughs> My goodness. Well, again, we want to thank you for being here on the program. Uh, I can see where anybody reading this book would see it just the way uh, one of uh, the readers had, just as well as I had, that it wasn't so much that we want to focus on that, but how a person can continue one step at a time. And maybe forgiveness doesn't happen, but certainly you had shifts that I would kind of consider to be forgiveness, you know, ways that you began to see things again. You know, for instance, as, as as you've said in your book, you know, that you've finally seen that not only has your dad suffered, but he stayed the trail. In other words, that's his karma, and he's come to accept that responsibility. That's a hero's journey. It may not be one people throwing confetti all over, but it is, yep. uh, and that you are truly now at the hardest point, but it's it's nice to know that you and your family have reached a summit, and it's now, where do we go from here? I love that. Well, you can use it. I'll let you. Thank you. (laughs) Tracy Ross, is there a website people can find out more about your work? Uh, Thesourceofallthings.com is a new website. And then I post uh, all kinds of different things on my Facebook page, which is Tracy Ross Author. Tracy Ross Author.com, right? Um, That's what you would just search for on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll be sure to put a hot link on our blog along with uh, a nice little uh, archive of this interview as well so people will be able to access that a lot easier because it's not just about what you have survived but what it made you, which is a tremendous not only adventure writer, but when you read some of the experiences or a lot of the experiences you've had, I can see people in the city going, you know, I think I might want to do some of those things. So it's a very inspiring book to get back out there and get moving again. Excellent. Thank you for being on the program today, Tracy. Thank you so much. Again, the book is The Source of All Things, our guest Tracy Ross. We encourage you to visit us at our website, which is beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. And as I mentioned, also go to our blog. We're going to archive this show and have a nice hot link for you to find out more about it. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Remember, live your day past halfway.